right. Yeah, come take a seat. Our next speaker is Klaus Landefeld, who, due to his profound expertise in the IT industry and tech regulation, is a wanted advisor on various international committees. Among a range of roles, he is the vice chair of the management board of ECO, Association of the Internet Industry. Klaus was also part of the official implementation task force of the so-called AUE evidence regulation, which was proposed in 2017 and completed this year. Since then, the law mandates cross-border access to all sorts of stored information by law enforcement. But how is it going to be implemented legally and technically? And what about potential gray areas? Klaus is here to provide us an insider view on these questions and will hopefully also shed some light on how individuals are actually affected by this new regulation. And let's give him a warm welcome to the stage, Klaus Landefeld. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, uh, hello everybody. Thank you very much for having me. Um, uh, unfortunately, this is not a repeat of the, uh, uh, the 36 C3 talk because um, uh, by now this beast has become regulation. It's, um, it has become part of EU regulation, um, and what we're looking at, um, what we'll look at right now, short uh, agenda, I want to uh, show you what the evidence is about, the categories of data affected, who is addressed by the regulation, when will it enter into force, um, how does the electronic production order work, and um, the problems identify legal challenges, and so on. Um, so what is it about? Um, uh, the evidence has become uh, de facto law this year with um, the EU regulations uh, 23, 1543 and 1544. One is about the electronic production order itself, so this is about um, uh, electronic evidence in criminal matters. Let's be clear about this. This is all about criminal matters, so there needs to be some criminal proceeding uh, by law enforcement in one EU member state in order for this to take effect and um, be applicable. Um, and um, the other directive uh, is about the designation of a representative. So everyone who has to observe uh, the, um, the regulation uh, will need to designate a representative or a legal representative, basically, where um, uh, production orders can be addressed to. Um, so um, it's not entirely new. The data concerned was um, available through multilateral agreements before. That means um, there was a de facto procedure when one state could, re or law enforcement of one state could request data from an another state or service providers in another state through a very lengthy paper process, basically. It's, it's been around for decades, um, and it is very slow. It's not digitized. This is about digitizing the process, um, but unfortunately it has become a very cumbersome way to, to do this. Um, uh, but, as I said, it, it was in principle available before, now, the new thing is that the authorities in the, in the target state will only be partially involved. Um, uh, in principle, service providers will send data or release data directly to the inquiring law enforcement agency from another EU member state. So this is all about within the EU, um, but you ha will have to answer not only to your local law enforcement from now on, but also for law enforcement from other countries. Um, uh, what is it about? The categories of data are in principle subscriber data, so everything identifying a user, um, uh, not the traffic and content data. Um, the traffic and content data itself will also be available, um, but this is all about stored data. So this is not about data in motion, this is not about tapping uh, telephone calls or um, uh, uh, things like that, or intercepting emails. This is about stored data, but that could be anything up until whatever, a whole cloud instance. So, um, any sorts of data can be requested from law enforcement, from a service provider in another EU country. Um, however, the, the, there is a limitation which basically says there needs to be a criminal proceeding of substantial crime. Um, and the, the way they figured this out is that there needs to be a, an at least three-year maximum custodial, a minimum of a three-year maximum custodial sentence. So, the offense needs to have a, a sentence which is at least three years or more in order to be applicable for this. But 
immediately there was an exception. Um, the exception uh, meaning uh, where, where it is applicable even for crimes where there's less than three years of a sentence. Um, this is cyber-related offenses where there's only electronic evidence, um, which could be all sorts of things nowadays, um, but also um, uh, things which are mi minor offenses by itself, but it's, it's uh, been, been done in a mass, uh, in, in a, in a ma uh, mass proceedings, which obviously uh, could happen in the internet, could be um, a, a ransomware attacks, could be, could be spam, could be, could be anything, could be phishing, things like that. Um, uh, and of course, uh, we always have that terrorism-related offences and offences concerning sexual abuse and sexual exploitation of children, but that has a higher sentence anyway. Um, uh, who is addressed? So who will have to absorb this? Um, uh, so this uh, typical is providers of electronic communication services. That is nothing new. So everyone um, uh, doing telephony, doing email, doing uh, uh, instant messaging, things like that. Um, and internet infrastructure, pro infrastructure providers, um, which is uh, uh, ripe, for example, everyone providing IP addresses, uh, domain registers, um, uh, things like that. Um, so this is nothing new. But there is something really new in there, which is information society service providers. Um, this is all sorts of electronic services on the internet. Um, could be anything. It was limited with um, uh, two provisions, which says um, the, there needs to be some user service about storing data or processing data, or the users need to be able to communicate with each other. Um, this is derived from an uh, from, from some other EU definition. Um, I, I have it in here, you don't really need to concern it. This is available for download everything. I included it for, for um, uh, completeness sake. Um, so what does it mean? It is really broadening the field of service providers. Um, so te uh, telecommunication service providers, we've always had to do this. We have to do this for decades to deliver data to law enforcement. Um, but now um, the, these, these two provisions of communication between users it could be anything, it could be comments, right? So how can users of your platform communicate with each other? Um, also, what means uploading content? Um, I know a lot of um, uh, football clubs, things like that, where you can upload videos, you can upload pictures. This is all data storage. So all of them are affected now. Um, uh, and uploading data and some further processing could be whatever, picture processing services could be uh, your heating system, uh, where, where data is uploaded all the time. Um, uh, most prominently, of course, video services, where your video camera is storing data somewhere on a cloud service or something like that. This is all part, of, this is all affected by the regulation. So every service provider offering a service like this uh, is now part of the, of the regulation. So that means even small and not-for-profit organizations need to concern themselves with this new regulation. There's no exemptions provided for associations, clubs, cloud services, IoT, off-site video store, gaming services, whatever. No exceptions are in the text right now. Um, there's also no size caps in the text. So it doesn't matter if you have 10 users or 100,000 users, you're affected. Um, when will it enter into force? So the technical definitions and the Implementation Act, and I'll talk about this um, a bit later, there, will be, have to be finished by October 20, 2024. So in order to, um, so, so that the Implementation Act, which really says, and how will this be implemented, what interfaces, what protocols will be used to release the data, um, can be implemented in the member states and by the service providers. Um, the actual going live is on the 18th February of 26. Um, and the um, transition, end of the transition period, by then every service provider will have to name a representative on who to address um, requests to, uh, and on the 18th of August 26. So if you really consider that you need to implement something and, and it needs to be coordinated internationally, this is not a very long time. It's actually a rather short implementation time frame. Um, uh, there is a provision in there which, say, which says that um, designated establishments or basically the, the, uh, the technical entities interfacing with law enforcement can be used um, by, by several service providers um, and that is supposed to work for very small service providers or medium-sized enterprises. And I'll come back to that in the end because I think that, is, uh, that, that might be a hook where 
clubs and not-for-profits uh, could work together. Um, statistic collection will also start in August 26, because there's obviously a review in there uh, which says that, that all the numbers, how often will this be used, um, uh, is supposed to be uh, fully disclosed. There should be statistics on it and everything. Um, how does an electronic production order work? Um, it's, um, there is a issuing authority. This is basically law enforcement um, or a court in the um, uh, in a country where a crime was committed, there's a service provider who's obliged to respond to, uh, to this request by the issuing authority, and then there's something which is called an, an enforcing authority. This is basically an authority in this country where the service provider is registered or where the legal representative of the service provider is registered in order... Well, the principal idea is that if the service provider doesn't respond, this authority, because it's in the same country, can enforce that it is actually happening, that data will be released, so that there's legal means to actually uh, make this work. But there's more... Um, uh, the enforcing authorities has have additional um, uh, tasks which they need to do, which is basically has to do with the pro protection of the individuals. Um, so the production of the requested data, when you receive a request, you have 10 days to respond to it, in principle. In emergency cases, if there's, uh, this is about um, a loss of life or a threat to life, um, kidnappings, whatever. So really, emergency cases, you have eight hours to respond. So I'm not so sure how a not-for-profit or a very small organization can ensure that 24-7 uh, uh, they can respond within eight hours. It's not supposed, obviously this will only happen very seldomly to smaller entities, but who knows? Um, uh, if terrorists or whatever are using your service, uh, are using your club to exchange information, upload videos, could be anything, you, you don't know. Um, uh, there's also something called a European Preservation Order, but that does, is not that important right now, but there, uh, basically law enforcement can ask you if they can't procure the right um, signatures by a judge or something, they can basically ask you to save data for 60 days so that nothing gets deleted. Um, uh, obviously, you can't inform the person this is about, and um, uh, there's also uh, provisions of enforcement. Uh, there's pecuniary san sanctions if you, don't, um, if you don't reply. There could be cost reimbursement if it's in the law of the requesting country, but this is uh, really only um, uh, relevant if uh, you have huge volume and if there's a lot of requests of that type coming in. Um, so there will be a central directory of service providers where service providers will register with a central authority. So basically everyone has to do this. Um, and um, uh, it could be a, a designated establishment, which is um, an organization basically doing this, uh, offering this as a service. It could be the service provider itself um, who, is, um, who is connecting with the authorities. It could be just the legal representative, uh, uh, so some, um, um, some legal office which is representing an, an outside of EU service provider. You could have several channels, which will become very important later on. Um, so it doesn't mean that you only have to have one point of contact. You could have a point of contact in every country. Um, and um, uh, that is basically what happens. It's a bit unclear how... Uh, if. Uh, Law enforcement was obviously under the impression that you could just say, okay, it's this company, but um, uh, the providers have already made clear that, well, it's not that simple. It could be this company for email, it could be this company for, um, uh, for telephony. Um, so it's not just one entity. Um, so, so we really need something like a routing database um, uh, where services and, and entities are routed through in order to address the, the proper service provider. Um, so there's possible regulation players. Maybe this is um, getting a bit too much into depth right now, considering the time we have. Um, uh, in principle, uh, the issuing authorities can go directly to the designated establishment and request data. This is happening when there's something called a national case in play. What this really means, I'll tell you in a second. If there's an international case, um, everything needs to be validated by... Um, uh, by a court or at least by a prosecutor and then it can be sent to the legal representative but then there will also be a notification in parallel to the enforcing authority. So if you really look at this as workflows, the national case, um, what, what does that mean? It means that the crime committed and the, um, the supposed uh, perpetrator of the crime uh, are 
um, uh, are within the same country or um, at least considered to be um, uh, citizens of the same country, but they might be using a, a service outside of their country. So it's still considered a national case. Everything will still be in a uh, national jurisdiction. And um, uh, so there will be no notification at all. There's no notification supposed to happen if that is really um, uh, considered a national case and data, it's just data being requested um, from a service provider outside of the country. That might lead to some problems for service providers uh, considering that um, Let's use the example of an email address. Um, you have, um, um, they think, or legal, law enforcement thinks that it's someone who is um, a national of, of their own country, but this, the person might have registered with you with some other address, and you might consider this to be a national of, of the country where the service provider is located. Um, and and there, is no, uh, there is no conflict resolution for that right now. Service providers will ha have to raise an objection and basically say, well, wait a second, this is not a national case. We need to make this an international case. Um, but this is not, um, it's not part of the process right now. We're trying to get this to become part of the process. Um, in the international case, this is, uh, will, we believe will be the standard case, and most of the inquiries will, uh, will, will have, to use that, um, uh, uh, have to use that scheme. It basically means um, a law enforcement requests data from, it will typically be a very large service provider, so think uh, Meta or, or Google or something like that, um, and there will be hundreds of thousands of cases where this will be used. Um, uh, so th there, there will be a notification to this service provider, in most cases located in Ireland, uh, and there will be a notification to the enforcing authority, which will be the enforcing authority again in Ireland. Um, much fun for the Irish to actually come up with an enforcing authority large enough to cope with all these requests, um, but we'll see how that goes. Um, and if there is no grounds for refusal, if the enforcing authority does not say, no, you can't deliver the data, then the service provider will have to uh, respond within 10 days. Unfortunately, um, the time for the enforcing authority to tell you that there is no re re grounds for refusal is also 10 days. So basically, you'll always, as <laughs> whoever came up with that idea, um, but that's how it is in the text, meaning um, you basically have to wait till the last second before you can send out any data. Um, because the time frames are the same. So you, you basically have to wait. Will there be a, a refusal raised by the enforcing authority and then you can send out data? Um, currently there are discussions if there could be something like a positive notification, basically saying we don't raise an objection and then uh, you can send the data beforehand because obviously um, law enforcement would like to have the data quicker than 10 days, but um, that's where we are right now in the implementation. Um, if there is a refusal, um, what happens? Um, the enforcing authority will first uh, contact the issuing authority, that's the green arrow going from the right to the left, and discuss um, the, the, these grounds for refusal, and then they'll either amend the, um, the order and to make it um, processable, or um, if they don't amend it, and the enforcing authority will the provider no. Um, we refuse that, we raise an objection, and then you don't send any data. Um, again, the 10 days. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to resolve that, that, time, uh, that timing in there, but um, that's the task which the implementation um, group is currently um, considering or looking at right now. Um, what does it mean for the protection of the individuals? I think that is really what, what is most interesting for this group here. Um, there can be grounds of refusal based on, let's say, the obvious stuff, which, which is always easy to get into, um, into uh, regulation. Um, so, yes, if the data requested are protected by immunities or privileges, um, meaning if it's uh, a lawyer, a parliamentarian, uh, uh, a priest, um, uh, but it could also be press, um, then you're not supposed to deliver this data. It raises the interesting question, who actually knows this? Because service providers typically don't know this. Um, uh, and who will actually raise the objection? Will it be the service provider? Will the enforcing authority have to research this, observe it? That's uh, the big question right now. Um, some countries have already said, no, we're not going to, going to research anything here. We're, um, uh, uh, we will just wait if someone else raises an objection. Um, 
Uh, so the other grounds for refusal, if, if the execution of the order would entail a manifest breach of the basically the Charter of Human Rights or the EU Charter, um, uh, also uh, very clear because if, if, uh, if, if the release of data would validate, uh, um, violate your human rights, um, you're not releasing any data. Um, again, who will raise that? Who will actually do the legal checking in, in these bits? Um, uh, then also uh, one thing is the execution order would be contrary to Nebis Idem. Basically, you can't have double uh, a cr uh, a criminality and you can't be prosecuted for, for something twice. If uh, someone would actually know that you've already been prosecuted for this crime, wherever you know that from, um, uh, the service provider most certainly won't know that. So um, they will never raise that. Um, and um, then... Uh, there's this interesting question if the crime this is about is actually an offense in the law of the enforcing state, um, which could maybe not be the case. Uh, maybe this is only um, a crime in the, uh, in the issuing country. And we have that case. We have whatever um, abortion in Poland. We have um, uh, the, uh, the Putman case. And so, so basically... Um, uh, building a, a new government <laughs> versus your own government, things like that, which are not a crime in other, in other countries, but in Spain it is. So, and there's any number of cases if you really dive into it, because there is no harmonization of, um, of the criminal laws. To a certain extent there is, but um, there, there is no really a, a, a harmonization of the proceedings, the criminal proceedings between the countries. Uh, this is vastly different if, if you really look at the European countries. Um, uh, there are some further protections in there which are interesting if you really read it. So the service provider could basically say, um, I cannot validate the, the, um, uh, the authority sending me this because the digital certificate is not, <laughs> is not checkable. Um, that will become an interesting bit because uh, law enforcement has a huge problem in signing these orders. Um, we've negotiated in the proposal, so this has in the trilogue, it, it became part of this. That, um, that every order needs to be digitally signed, but um, who is actually a competent authority, how that works, who can sign it, how can that be validated, that this is something which can be signed, it's unclear right now. Um, uh, and um, uh, also the service provider could basically look at the timing and say, okay, this is only valid, becomes an order when it is signed, when it's digitally signed, but the, um, uh, the, the actual law enforcement authority might have um, issued that order beforehand. There might be a time difference uh, up to several days, depending on the country, um, between um, them actually writing up that they want this data and uh, someone actually, a judge or something, signing the order. Um, there could be a time difference. And what happens with data which is collected in that time frame? Which time um, uh, is actually the relevant time frame? If you release data, was that already collected at that point in time? Was it collected afterwards? Was it collected before? And that is relevant uh, because uh, you might be liable as a service provider if you just release data which is not covered by, um, uh, by, the, um, by the epoch you receive. Um, and uh, also, interestingly enough, there was a political um, thing which was negotiated in there, which is uh, basically saying um, uh, uh, if, um, if a state, the enforcing authority, um, is, uh, is worried that um, the person might not have a fair trial in the other country or there's, um, uh, there's deficiencies in the independence of the issuing state's judiciary, I mean, we're talking within Europe, right? So we're, we're not, obviously the states are not even sure that, that there is due process and there, is a, there might be a breach of a fair trial within Europe. Um, but okay, uh, still, obviously we want to help each other out to the point that we send data. Um, but okay, so this political uh, possibilities in there, meaning the enforcing authorities has a lot of options to actually say, no, you don't deliver this data, but this is a purely political decision, and it means you actually need to look at the individual order. And and this is not going to happen for the majority of cases. You need to have some list, some flagging of a person's identity where you basically say, no, for this person we don't deliver data, and the enforcing authority will actually raise the objection themselves, because the service provider in this case can never raise the objection. Um, so the problems for service providers, there are some problems um, as well, which is uh, the eight-hour uh, emergency response is possible for small companies. I don't think that any private organization will be able to do this. Um, um, there's also the, uh, the, the 
it basically says if you, if you uh, act in good faith, if you just release data, you cannot be prosecuted uh, uh, as a service provider. But then they put this in good faith in there. But if you already know there is a protection, if you already know that you can't, actually can't release the data because the person should be protected or it's not, criminal, it's not, uh, it, it, it's not a criminal offense in your country, how can you act in good faith? Um, and so, so you, you might open up yourself for litigation if you actually, but by the user, if you actually release the data. Um, still, there are significant uh, pecuniary penalties in there. Um, so it's GDPR style. It might be 4% of your global turnover if you don't, re, uh, if you don't respond to, um, to requests. So you basically have to ensure that you do respond to requests. Um, and... Um, uh, Interestingly enough, you might receive um, requests because the, the requests are only evaluated under the law of the country which issues the request. But um, there's a lot of stuff which is illegal in certain countries um, uh, and, uh, and legal in another country in the, in the processing of requests. Um, for example, um, if you, in Spain, um, uh, law enforcement could ask for whatever, the city of Madrid who was locked into the cell phone network at, at any point in time. But you could take the whole city. This is completely illegal in Germany. You could never make this request. Um, and and, and there's, there's any number of requests you can, one can envision which is impossible uh, to answer in, in, in one nation state, um, but is legal in another nation state. Or, for example, in Italy, um, data is released just on the telephone number. You don't need to know who the individual is. In Germany, you only release data um, based on the individual. You need to rec uh, get a request based on a person, not on, uh, on a telephone number. How do you resolve that? Um, it would be illegal to answer the request just based on the telephone number, release content or traffic data. Um, we don't do that. So, and, and, and the, so there's a number of countries who have higher protection standards, uh, Netherlands, uh, Austria, Germany, so on, and there's a number of countries where they basically release everything normally and don't ask questions, which is Spain, Italy, and so on. Um, it's very difficult to reconcile uh, it. Um, uh, and the, um, there are conflict of law scenarios where basically you say, well, I can't release that data because third-party uh, laws uh, prohibit me from doing that. So that's, for example, a problem between Europe and the US, where you can't release data. Um, uh, even so, um, uh, you would have to release it in, in Germany, but um, Microsoft, for example, would say, no, sorry, but uh, US law prohibits me from, from releasing that data, and that needs to be resolved. So it is part of, of, um, uh, of the regulation, but only for third-party countries. Um, effectiveness of protections, is that actually effective? Um, no, it is not, because the, the setup of your service provider is completely relevant. Um, if you are located in the same country than your service provider, um, your enforcing authority uh, will basically check if you have protections in your country. That's normal. You could do that. And the enforcing authority might be able to check that you have protection, that you're a member of parliament, that you're a lawyer, a, pr a priest, whatever, a journalist in your country. Um, in the other variant, um, it's basically the enforcing authority is someone else. Consider the case in Ireland. I, I said if you, what, uh, uh, law enforcement of country A requests um, data from Facebook. And the page actually says, hey, I'm a, uh, I'm a parliamentarian in Austria. Um, so Facebook would know, hey. There, there are protections there. You can, we can't release that data um, right away. That would be the Austrian Parliament would have to be agree that this data is released. Um, but the enforcing authority in Ireland would only check if that person is protected in Ireland. Um, so meaning um, the checks fail through. Um, the data will be released and potentially even stored. Um, uh, because depending on the uh, local legislation, in some countries, e all evidence you gather will have to be stored by law enforcement, even if the case is dismissed and you say, I don't, I don't uh, further process that. Um, so um, it really depends on the setup of your ISP. If the ISP would actually locate a register in all EU countries, um, and route all cases just through the nation state where the user is located, this problem would completely go away. But what does that mean? That means that there will be a lot of court cases because the non-involvement of the user's home country 
in the setup. Um, it was discussed in the past, but it was abolished in the trilogue. Um, so there was a question of, do we send out two notifications, one to the enforcing authority of the service provider and one to the user's home country? But the states didn't want to bother themselves with that. They basically, it's too much work, uh, we, can't, uh, we can't do that. Um, uh, and all we, all we really want is that law enforcement gets the data, <laughs> period. That's, that's really what this was about. Um, so it is, um, it is an uh, upcoming problem, and the EU courts will have to concern themselves with it. Normally they check, is there a difference um, between how users are treated? <laughs> yes, no, there, there will be a difference in how users are treated. So we believe that this will not be upheld if challenged, but it will take several years for this to go away or be amended in a way that it is, uh, will become acceptable. Um, there's also something, um, an interesting question. You might never have left your country. You have a hacked account somewhere, um, you never contracted with someone outside of your country, you never left your country, you never went to the country which is uh, litigating against you, um, uh, you might not even not have uh, committed a punishable offense in that country or in your home country, and you, there still might be a trial going against you, or an, an, at least an investigation against you in that country, which, uh, which then also requested and get, got data from you. Um, that is um, something which we normally don't have. Normally you would have to go to the country where the person is located in order to litigate against that person. Uh, now, with uh, your evidence, you might actually have to find a lawyer in that country and defend yourself against that, even, you ne even so you never went there. Um, so what can still be done? This is a regulation which is in effect, it is there. Um, the procedures, as well as the design of the central system where everything is routed through, and, um, uh, and, and if, if, for example, these things like, um, will there be a positive notification? Uh, that is all determined next year. And everyone who is an affected entity can go to their own country's ministries and basically say, well, we need workable regulation. So they can still push um, in the implementation process that this will become workable procedures and, uh, and systems. So th there are things trivial questions sometimes where you say, well, what happens if the enforcing authority is completely overwhelmed? Take the case of Ireland. So, and, and they don't respond within 10 days. Will the service provider release data? The case was never even looked at. Will you, is the default to release, release data or is the default that you don't release data if you don't get a positive notification or, or, or any reply from the uh, notification authority? Um, and and so we believe, as service providers, we believe the default should be no. No, we don't release data if you haven't even looked at the, at the, at the case. Um, but, and, and we know already that, that building the capabilities in a lot of countries will be very, very difficult. They will have a, a big issue in, in actually building um, the, the capacity to look at the notifications to really do the checks. And there's also no registries. Most countries... Even the authorities don't know who is a lawyer, who is a priest, who is a journalist, and things like that. There is no central register for these functions. So who will raise the protections? That is still a very big problem. That's besides all the technical arguments that um, uh, some countries obviously think that digital signage is still some, some novelty um, and uh, that uh, verifying a request, or, or they, uh, we, we even have proposals that they say, yeah, well, individual law enforcement can issue that, but we only sign that centrally. So you basically have a digital signature from some central authority within that country, but you don't really know who uh, was the person who issued that. Uh, really the person, um, or is that person authorized to send the request because we believe that this will happen automatically if they send it through their national system, they will automatically sign it and then send it out. There will be no, um, uh, no actual um, uh, responsibility which can be assigned to a certain individual. Um, uh, obviously, uh, uh, the providers ask that they can verify everything automatically in the digital and that there should be a capability flag or something like that in there who can actually authorize which type of requests and things like that. So, as a, um, so this is what, what can still be done. Um, uh, lobby your ministries. Um, and also, I believe we should have a dis or start a discussion if we can build an association of federation of non-profit affected entities who will register as these designated establishments because you can, several service providers could use them. We could have thousands of service providers basically registering through one entity and run this through the national system because there will be no volume. Most entities will never, uh, most service providers will never receive a single request 
uh, with this huge broad base of tens of thousands of organizations who now have to um, sign up as a service provider and, and never had to do this. And they will never receive a request. So how can we cope that uh, all, at least the non-for-profit uh, organizations will find a way to do this in a way that you don't have to pay a monthly fee or, or maybe a very small yearly fee or something like that in order to uphold that, um, uh, that requirement. But, um, so this is a discussion I hope we can, we can start or can have. Um, I haven't decided on a way to do this right now, but um, maybe we can do this within CCC or something like that. I think uh, there, there will be a good starting point here. All right, yeah, thank you. And um, I'm happy to, if we have time. Yes, uh, thank you, Klaus, for walking us through this really complex regulation. Um, we do have five minutes for questions, uh, which is why I would first uh, call our signal angel. If we have any questions from the interwebs already, and for everyone else, please keep it short. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Signa Angel, you're good to go. Yes, the first question is, does this list of providers include things like, power, like sorry, vacuum companies and power inverter companies? Because we've seen talks how they also store data about you. That's a very good question. The question really is, do they collect and store data, and is that done on the user's request? So we're having the discussion right now if, if the, uh, um, uh, the appliance would actually collect data not um, on, on the user request, but because they want to sell it or whatever, or to better their product, then this was not, would not be part of it. But if you, if you have it um, as, uh, if, for example, you said power inverters or things like that, sometimes you, you there actually store data in order to get good proof profiles on how is, that, uh, how is your usage, uh, how is it effective, and things like that. So there is, this is data storage and processing, which is explicitly mentioned in the text. And since there are no provisions that this is not covered, um, uh, we, we don't see that this is um, not applicable for that right now. Okay, thanks. Um, Mike 3, this time. Thank you. Very similar question. Um, does it also affect email services run by a company only for their own employees or um, like I run a mail server just for my family? Would that also count as a service provider? Um, uh, no, private individuals are not uh, are not in there. So it needs to be some organization uh, uh, providing something for their, their members or users or something like that. So um, uh, private individuals are exempt. They are not part of the regulation. So also a company running the mail server for their employees? Uh, this, well, you would, you would never have the confidentiality which is required in this. So this is also not, not part of it because law enforcement would never accept to send something to a company which would then inform their employees or, or, or cover their own assets, sorry, to use that call. So, so no, they are they're not part of the process. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mike, one, one question and short, please. Uh, okay, um, just for clarification. So when I'm a service provider hosting a Mastodon server for other people, I need to respond to requests within eight hours. So I'm not allowed to sleep for eight hours. I need to check my email every seven hours. And there is no protection for national security, so the Spanish police might be able to request service providers for the data of the German secret service or the German witness protection programs, right? Um, well, it needs to be a criminal offense. So this is, for, for example, Italian secret market. services and things like that are, are out of scope. However, in some countries, they're not completely separated from, from the rest, like in France or Austria and so on. For example, so. the secret service uses a service provider, for example, a telecom, to mm -hmm. host data. <laughs> what, what can I say? Yeah, it's, as long as it's a service provider, it's part of it, and they could request it. Um, who's actually behind it uh, is, is not part of the, of the regulation. And for your sleep part, yeah, that is the big problem, right? How would you, how would you address these eight-hour time frames? But obviously, you can have some notification scheme, and normally, uh, unless you're a very large organization, you would typically never receive a request, but you would need to ensure that they can, uh, you can basically get alerted. <laughs> yeah. I believe we have another question from the internet, Signal Angel. Uh, yes, in, in, internet is saying, uh, it states in the slide that the data might be required to be preserved until further notice. Is there some provision for how long does that mean or is it really forever? No, no, the preservation order is for 60 days. If you don't receive a proper request uh, within the 60 days, you can delete the data and, and that's it. So there is a very clear 
um, a very clear time frame for that. But the, 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 the requirements to get this are lowered. So basically, law enforcement can say, oh, well, we're working on this. Pr protect the data, because you need this, because in, in a lot of cases, it's only there for seven days or something like that, uh, log data and things like that. So um, they want uh, you to protect it so that it doesn't get deleted, because it takes some time for them to get it properly approved by a judge. Um, and in some countries, you have to get this approval by, by a judge in a court order. Otherwise, you can't request the data. OK, time for last question from my two. Please make it short. Yeah. So uh, how this law deals with the authenticity of the data? Like uh, when the law enforcement has it, does have they have to have a, like a signature from the until that they um, give it back, give it to like this external law enforcement? I mean, I ask this question because, for example, in German criminal law, as far to my knowledge, when the law enforcement gets the data, they don't have to do anything about this authenticity, and like a judiciary has this perfect trust to the law enforcement that uh, they didn't do anything with the data. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, this is a very good question, because the question is also about how do you send data, is it encrypted, is it authenticated, is it signed, um, uh, and, and will it be usable in court, right? And, and that is, so you, as a service provider, you basically represent that this is, to the best of your knowledge, the data which was asked for, and you have to sign up. You could be asked as a witness to, to represent that this later, if there is a court case, right? We're talking about collecting evidence for a criminal proceeding right now, which doesn't mean that this is exactly what will happen in, in the court case. Case, right? So there could be a, um, an extension there where you are asked as a witness to represent that this is really the data which, uh, which you collected to the best of your, your knowledge. But it's an interesting question because the system which is proposed right now uh, is even incapable to, use, uh, to, to, to be used for huge amounts of data, for example. There's, there's, we're discussing a side channel on to, to how, for example, cloud data could be released because the system which is currently in place or considered to be in place is limited to one gigabyte of data. And there's a lot of cases where this is a joke, right? So we won't cover it. So there will be separate channels and separate systems, and they all have to validate that the data is authentic and that, that it is signed for on the spec channel as well. So, so the, the providers, are, are, uh, they, they, they have to sign everything they release, all the messages uh, or data they release needs to be signed. All right. Uh, thanks for the questions. Thanks for the answers. Um, I know there's a lot to discuss, many questions, but our time is over. Thanks again, Klaus. I believe you will be Thank here you. for a couple of minutes.